My name's Charlie and this is my fishing story. Back when I was about eight years old, my mother and my future stepdad were taking graduate classes in Nashville, Tennessee at George Peabody University and Vanderbilt University. And when my mom was in class, my stepdad would take my brother and I fishing. There was, there was a park in Nashville called Centennial Park. And it had a lot of really nice bass in it. So we'd take our, our Zepco reels and we'd go fish down there. Plus, on one side of it, the locals had a casting league. And they'd set almost like hula hoops, but smaller out in the water and, and cast for accuracy and get so many points for each one. But anyway, <clears throat> later in the summer, my stepdad was looking for a job teaching. He was a biology teacher. So he came to Wisconsin because he had relatives here. And he went up to Oshkosh and he got a job at Oshkosh High School teaching science classes, biology, so on and so forth. And with, when having two parents as teachers, you got to do a lot of reading. They were, they were always having you read about where we're gonna go, so on and so forth. So my stepdad always had sports field and uh, outdoor life magazines. And there was an article in one of the out outdoor life magazines about Wisconsin's muskie fishing. And it showed a guy holding these big muskies and I just looked at him and I said, let's go to Wisconsin. <laughs> I wanna catch one of those someday. When we moved to Oshkosh, we rented a place on Lake Winnebago and it was a summer home until we could find a place in town and we fished it 63 days in a row and never got skunked and, and, and that's when I was going into fifth grade. I would also say that another person that was really heavily involved in it was my father-in-law. He had taken trips to Canada so in about 1972, we got together, my brother, he had just got back from the service, and I and my father-in-law, we took our first trip to Canada then. My first muskie trip was to Land Lakes, Wisconsin, Con in, the, in the Conover area. And uh, I would say I was 22 at the time, 23, and we rented a or we got a room at a little motel up there. It was five dollars per guy per night. And the guy who owned the motel told us go to Irving or Ballard Lake. Well, I'd heard of them, but I'd never been there. They're, they're side by side. Well, the funny part that day was when we were putting a boat in the water. I don't know if you've heard of him. I met Tony Rizzo. Yeah. He was taking a client out on Ballard Lake. Well, the funny thing was. When we thought we were going to fish on Ballard Lake, we were on Irving Lake. <laughs> and the first day that we were there, we raised 22 muskies and caught three. But there wasn't one fish over 36 inches. The, the key bait that day was uh, a pipe jointed pikey minnow. Something that really sticks out in my mind is a 48 inch tiger muskie. Uh, my father-in-law and I had been walleye fishing, which when I was young, it was rough on me. I didn't have the patience. I wanted to, I wanted to cast because I knew the fish were out there. But he came from the generation of fishing means meat. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, we were sitting up on the top of an island and uh, eating lunch. It was probably about noon, and we were looking around at the scenery and stuff. And he said, "Hey, Charlie, he says, have we ever fished that bay over there?" And I said, "No, we've never, never been into that one at all." 
And he goes, well, after we eat lunch, let's go in here and cast. Looks like it might be pretty good. So we did, <clears throat> and we had worked our way down into what I would call the, f the foot of the bay. And there were lots of really nice cabbage weed and everything in there. And uh, he was having trouble keeping his bait out of the weeds. The wind was blowing in hard and everything. He says, find a lure for me in my tackle box, Charlie, that you think will stay out of the weeds. So I looked in it. Of course, he, most of his lures from, from the 1930s to the 1960s, you know. And I found a little weedless daredevil, maybe three inches long. And I said, here, put this on, that's your lure. Well, I had uh, was throwing a spinner bait at the time of yellow one. Right when we got down into the bay, I cast out. And I was cranking mine in, and I went, holy smokes, is there a big fish there? And he goes, really? And I went, yeah, and I went, he disappeared, though. Well, what had happened, and this is a technique that I had read about, but we did it accidentally. Years ago, a guy, one guy used to cast over the other guy, and if a muskie was following his bait, when the other guy's bait crossed it, the muskie would follow his bait in. Well, all of a sudden he goes, I think I got him. And I'm like, whoa, it's a big one. He goes, how big do you think it is? And I said, four feet. And he goes, you're kidding, I didn't get a good hook set. And I said, well, don't worry about that right now. You know, so I set my rod down. And like I said, the wind was blowing us in. And I said, hang on, I'm gonna start the motor. We had a 14-foot Shell Lake one at the time with a 25-horse Johnson on. I said, I'm going to back us out real slowly into the middle of the bay. He goes, okay, fine. So I got us backed out into the middle of the bay, and I was watching his line, and I said, he's coming up. You can see his line starting to do this. And I said, jam your rod down into the water and hold it down, because if this guy jumps, you could lose him. So he did that, and the fish tried to jump, but it only got its head out of the water, and it had its gills flared. And you mentioned that that fish had a big head on it. That's not even close to what that tiger had on it. Well, this was back in 1978. We got him in the net, got him into the boat, and as soon as the fish kind of thrashed around the boat, the lure flew out of its mouth. So I said, do you want to keep him? Because this, I mean... He goes, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, we're talking, this is a trophy. And I said, well, somehow we're going to have to kill him, you know, do something. I said, I'm not going to grab that thing when he's flapping around like that. And uh, he goes, you got a toolbox, don't you? I said, yeah. He says, you got a wrench in there? I said, sure. He said, get it. So I got out a big crescent wrench. Well, my father-in-law was a farmer. And I said, well, what should I do here? And he goes, hit him right between the eyes. He said, that's what we did to pigs when I was young. <laughs> the place at that time that was called Holst Point, and they had a, an official scale for weighing. And at 48 inches, the fish weighed 29 pounds. It was, it was just a beautiful fish. His wife still has that fish on their enclosed porch. Al Smith from Boulder Junction mounted that fish. As a skin. Here's one thing that I hope, Jeff, that people realize when they watch this, you know, I, I'm... I've been talking about keeping fish, so on and so forth. That was the trend, and there was nobody who did replicas then. Right. Um, the, f the fish that you see over there with the suey king in all of its mouth, I called Lax's father at the time was in the business, and I called Fatante about getting replicas, and both of them told me, it's going to take a minimum of nine months to find a form to do that on. And that was, this was probably about the year 2000, 2001, right? Around. They were rare, really. And then when you found the price of a replica at that time versus a skin mount, it was totally, I think the first skin mounts that I had done were four something an inch versus today, what's a replica? 13, 14 dollars yeah. an inch? Yeah. But... Another thing that I want to emphasize is musky fishing is at its best right now. And one of the reasons that it's at its best is because of catch, photograph, and release. People release them. Yeah. You know, and when you're releasing, more people are going to have the chance to catch them. Uh, they're going to grow. They're going to get bigger. 
I mean, my gosh, I can't believe some of the muskies I've seen on Facebook this year, how big and fat they are. It's just... And another thing, um, people today can catch as many muskies in one day as people 40 years ago used to catch in their lifetime. There, there are some guys today that are producing 10 to 25 muskies a day. That was unheard of years ago. I can remember when I first went to Canada muskie fishing, if you got one muskie in the week, that was, that was a big deal, seriously. When I first started muskie fishing, the size limit, and it's, this is gonna sound strange, in Canada was 28 inches. 28 inches. From 28 inches, it went to 30 inches, 32 inches. From 32 inches, it went to 40 inches. From 40 inches, it went to 48 inches. And from 48 inches, it went to 54 inches. I think another thing that's really important that wasn't, it wasn't paid much attention to when I was young is how do you hold the fish vertical or horizontal? I mean, a lot of the pictures that I have of fish when I was young were holding the fish vertically. Today, the proper way is to hold them horizontal. You know, one of the biggest things that you watched out for when you were younger is your hands. You know, I mean, granted we weren't using the size lures and size hooks that we do today, but still though, when you catch a decent sized northern or a decent sized muskie, if it's big enough, you can't put your hand around it to hold it. So when they came out with a boga grip, we used a boga grip a lot. Right. Now, I still own a boga grip and it's in my boat, but I don't use it. We keep everything in the net, almost use the net like a corral to yeah. keep the fish and get the fish unhooked while it's in the net. You know, yeah. if you have to cut the hooks or do whatever, do it. And then from there, get your pictures real quick and get the fish right. back in the water. So I think the big emphasis today is keep that fish out of the water for the smallest possible time that you can keep them in the water for the most time. And I think that's probably one of the most important changes there is. Now, I was thinking the other day, you know, they talk about the mortality rate of muskies, so on and so forth. As far as I quote, no. In all the years I've muskie fished, I know of two muskies that died. Almost 41. Yeah, because I'll be 65 this year. So. We were out fishing and it just poured. And of course, none of us had we had your basic $10 rain suits in those days. I mean, there was nothing with Vortex or <laughs> Heli Hansen or Under Armour or any of that stuff. So after we fished for about two or three hours, we were soaked. We, I mean, everybody came back in. I think we had like nine guys in our group and we were in a big cabin at the time. And one of my friends said, hey, let's get the wood stove going. Everybody agreed to that, you know. And supposedly the guy who put the cardboard and the wood in it, knew what he was doing. Well, anyway, he he over put way too much cardboard in it, way too much wood in it. And when that thing heated up, the stove started jumping. Now this is the next part. Behind the stove, there's wallpaper on the wall. The wallpaper started coming off the wall. No, this is one that we rented years ago. This was, oh, that was on that same trip in 78 or 79. We thought we were gonna burn the cabin down in all honesty. <laughs> That's good. That's good. It was, it was jumping and making noises. Oh my gosh, that is something guys would do though, like oh, making yeah. a fire too big. <laughs> but you know, I've always had dogs. I had an uncle that was blind and he always had German Shepherds as his guide dogs. And uh, my brother and I used to spend a lot of time with my aunt and uncle. And I, I fell in love with dogs through my uncle. I got my first hunting dog when I was about 20, 19 or 20. It was an Irish setter. His name was Duke. He lived to be uh, one month of 19 years old. And I hunted him 14 years out of that. When he was 14, he got a tumor on his hip and it was cancerous and the vet said, you may live three months, six months, a year, you can't predict it. Well, he made it almost five more years after that. So We were scouting once for pheasants. We were over near Princess Point, north of Whitewater. And uh, I used to put snowmobile goggles on them. 
because he'd stick his head out the window of my truck. And I was looking up ahead, and I, my gosh, that looks like a rooster crossing the road. And all of a sudden, I heard this sound, and I looked next to him, and my dog wasn't there, and I looked out there. He spotted him, and he was running down the, the road, probably 75 yards ahead of me. He went on a point in the ditch, and the bird flushed out. And I got less stories about dogs. Quite a few years ago, it reached a point where I realized the love that the dogs have for hunting. And it was okay for me not to shoot a pheasant. That it was like you providing for your kids' happiness. That's what it's like for me. That about three o'clock every day, those dogs will come out and they'll sit and I'll show you where on the deck and they watch for me to come around. And then, I'm getting chills now. What? I'm getting chills right now. You know, if I'm going to hunt or if I'm going to take them to the dog park. But I watch them out there. And they get real uneasy after a while if I don't show up. And then I'll open a door and I'll, I'll be out in a minute. And then they'll make more sounds. <laughs> Billy, when I feed him, he's nuts. Well, you'll, you'll look at him and you go, Charlie, do you ever feed this dog? He is so wound up. I've never had a dog like that. I bet he, excuse me, 10 times a day. <laughs> he'll hit, he'll lay so many bombs out there compared to Shady, it's unreal. Then when we go to the dog park, he's got to go five times. And when he hunts, he's, he goes till nothing comes up. Yeah. My personal best is 54 inches. Caught it in Canada. I caught it in Missouri. So now you've heard my story. Watch yours. Just keep casting. The fish will come.